It was amazing. I feel like a real astronaut. Let me show you how to get into the plane. Okay. We're gonna put the parachute on. So I'm excited about it, kind of nervous about it. You know, we're trying to help build that professional workforce. Hey guys, I am here at the International Institute for Astronautical Sciences and through a chance encounter at the Kennedy Space Center, actually, I met one of the students here. He invited me to come check this out. And I thought you guys would really enjoy seeing some of the work that they are doing here. So let's get into it. The opportunity to for people to really understand what it's like to to work or live in space. Maybe you're just curious. The majority uh, have aspire to um, to go to space but also the majority want to have an intention and a purpose to it. They, they don't, aren't necessarily driven by it as a, as a tourist experience. They want to contribute something. In a nutshell, can you explain kind of what goes on here? Our focus is to provide opportunities, sometimes a traditional opportunities, uh, for people around the world to collaborate on research related to um, advancing human spaceflight. The International Institute of Astronautical Sciences, or IIAS, is a nonprofit with many partners like Florida Tech, Groton, Connecticut, with Survival Systems USA, and with the National Research Council of Canada. So I went on the tail end of a week long session with a nine person crew, and I got to see a glimpse of some of their training. They worked on suit donning and doffing, so understanding the spacesuit process what it's like to be in a spacesuit, and they did a simulation of a suborbital spaceship flight. So they worked on things like how to be mobile and perform exercises and complex tasks, like trying to flip this water bottle, which is pretty hard. What exactly were you doing in there? So we were doing a suborbital simulation of uh, cloud research, and we were simulating, studying, and picking up data for hopefully future missions. Well suited up, and what was that like? It was amazing. Um, I feel like a real astronaut. <laughs> what did uh, it feel like? Well, you have a bit less mobility, um, but there's AC flowing through the suit, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah. And all around, really great. What's your name? Toby. Toby? Yeah. And you want to be an astronaut, I'm guessing, or Fingers else you crossed. wouldn't be here? Yeah. What, um, how'd you hear about this program? I found out about it through online, through previous students, um, and they really inspired me to come here and be a part of this. Cool. What yeah. are you doing outside of this? Um, I'm currently a student. I'm at UC Davis. I'm studying aerospace engineering. They also did scenario-based physiological training in a hypoxia chamber. So this controls the atmosphere and can add or take away a lot of pressure. Oh my goodness. Okay, that's really low, uh, Gary. I want you to take your headset off and put your mask on. And this is preparing them for a rapid cabin depressurization. So this was about an hour long simulation and the purpose is for each individual to understand their own hypoxia symptoms. Then they had some G-force preparation. So understanding the G-force countermeasures and I got to see this one pretty up close and personal. Okay, so you're about to do what? I'm about to do the high gravity training for my flight. So I'm excited about it, kind of nervous about it. But I'm about to have fun. Awesome. We'll be sure to get your post reaction after you do it. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> what we do with the extra 300 is we take the students up as their first uh, real life experience with physiology, positive and negative Gs. Um, so we'll start them out with uh, a 2G turn left and right, and then we'll increase the 2 or 3Gs, whatever the cut students are comfortable with. Um, after that, we tighten up our harnesses a little bit more and we start doing loops. We get inverted. Uh, we'll do a positive 4G loop with a 0G parabola at the end of it, and it kind of uh, lets the students know, lets them experience what it would be like if you were uh, main thrusters or main boosters were turning off in a zero G atmosphere, it's going mm. from some positive four or positive five Gs to zero Gs. So we do a loop with a negative one or a zero G parabola at the top. And then um, if, there's any, if there's any time, usually we'll, I'll get, let the students do a little bit of a stick time, see what it's like to actually control the aircraft in different situations, do a loop or a roll, whatever they have time for. But, How long have you been flying? Uh, I've been flying since I was 16. Was, Jeez, 18 years. Oh my gosh. Uh, this is, I'm, I'm new to the program, not new to the aircraft. I have uh -huh. a few years uh, flight experience in the extra 300. So Melbourne's a pretty, pretty exciting little airport. Uh, it's a class Delta airport, but we do have commercial operations with American and Delta, uh, and Delta have connections here 
to, uh, to Charlotte as well as Atlanta. It's a very big flight training program school as well. We've got FIT on this side and another really great flight school that's on the other side called uh, Melbourne Flight Training Academy. Uh, they fly a little bit different aircraft, a little more high tech, like the Cirrus and uh, the Duchess multi-engine. Um, so you've got private pilot students that have never flown an airplane before, all the way up to, you know, like I said, Delta and American flying to this little airport. So, so this is this is the aircraft. This is the extra 300, and I'm gonna I'm gonna direct this towards you, Go ahead. and this is gonna be your, your safety briefing. Okay. So this is an extra 300. And it's a mono wing, low wing aircraft design. It was designed with positive to negative 20 g stress tolerances, but it's only certified to positive 10, negative 10. Um, we today are only gonna experience probably positive five, negative one, negative two, seeing how you're feeling. Uh, if you wanna do a little bit more than that, we'll, we'll try to, if we, if we have time, because it's only about a 20 minute flight. Okay. Uh, so it's a tandem seating, so you're gonna be sitting in front of me and I'm gonna be behind you. So all of our communications has to be verbal because I can't really see what you're doing other than mm -hmm. if you give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Mm -hmm. So I'll show you how to communicate between you and myself because it's too loud, you're gonna have a headset on. There's two big safety things I want to go over before we even get into the airplane. There's two words. The first word or safety word is stop. <laughs> if at any time you hear stop or you say stop, we're going to write the plane up and we're going to fly straight and level. And that could be because you're not feeling well. I'm not feeling well. I see traffic outside and we need to avoid them. Um, your seatbelt, you know, if you're uncomfortable, if it's too tight, too loose, uh, we're going to go into another maneuver and you want to make sure that your seatbelt, we both want to make sure your seatbelt and your so shoulder harnesses are nice and, and secure. The other command that you need to be conscious of is okay. bail out, okay. bail out, bail out. Bail out. Yeah. You need to hear it three times. Okay. All right. And that's really the only time you're going to hear that is if there's some type of mechanical issue, mm -hmm. malfunction. Um, one of the control surfaces has jammed and it's more, it would be safer to leave the aircraft on its own oh flying what? and we eject and we'll, we'll get out with our parachute. So you'll hear it three times, <laughs> bail out, bail out, bail out. At that point, I'm going to do my best. We're going to climb as, as high as we can. We'll probably be around four or 5,000 feet, which is still pretty low. Mm -hmm. I'm going to roll the aircraft inverted. What? We're going to jettison the canopy and the canopy is going to come off the aircraft. And that's when you have two little latches on your lap belt. That's mm -hmm. going to hold your shoulder harnesses as well as your lap belt together. You're going to release those and you're going to plop right out of the airplane. Okay. You're going to pull the D ring, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to open the parachute and it's going to deploy on its own. You don't need to do anything. And I want really good pictures when you're coasting down over the beach, okay? okay? Yeah. So we're not gonna need that. We do have the parachutes just in case because it is required by FARs because we are going to be uh, more than 30 to 45 degrees pitched up as well as more than 60 degrees of bank. We're gonna be rolling pretty quick. The extra has a 360 degree per second roll rate. So we'll actually be able to spin this plane right side up, upside down, right side up one whole time in less than a second. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Yeah. I might not be in the possum program, hey, maybe someday, but I wanted to learn more about classical mechanics like gravitational physics. Here on Brilliant, you can explore Newton's law of gravity and unpack its universe of consequences. There are 29 interactive quizzes and over 300 concepts and exercises that you will get to go through. Brilliant is the best way to learn math, science, and computer science interactively. Hands-on learning is the best way to learn this stuff and Brilliant has thousands of new lessons added monthly and there's so much on here from artificial neural networks to cryptocurrency, even everyday math if you need a refresher. And more than ever, the world needs smart. Understanding the science behind these problems is the first step to solving them. And this is college level content for everyone. You don't need to spend four years learning this stuff and a fortune. And you can get started for free. Visit Brilliant.org org slash Ellie in space, or just click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. This is the canopy right here. And the first thing I want to brief you on is these are not good places to hold on to. These are bullets that go into this part of the fuselage, which holds the canopy on. If you were to get nervous and grab this at any point, this is going to come flying off and it's a really expensive repair. So mm -hmm. let's just try not to do that. So your cockpit's a little bit different than mine. I've got all of these instruments and I know what about, you know, 30% of them do. So that's all we need to do. Stop. So in the front, you're gonna have your airspeed <laughs> indicator. We have a GoPro if you wanna turn it on, you're more than welcome to. And we also have a G meter in the front. And I'll show you how to turn that on and off so you can see how many Gs your body is experiencing. Okay. The best way to get into the airplane is gonna be right foot on this little ledge right here. Excuse me, right foot here. Mm -hmm. Left foot as far forward on the red paint as you can. And then you're gonna step into the plane, you're gonna slide down, and then I'm gonna get all your buckles on, okay? okay? 
All right, so we're gonna put this on just like a backpack. Right arm, left arm. And hold these straps right there so it's sitting right there on your back. I'm gonna tighten these up a little bit. When you were training, did you ever have to actually practice deploying the parachute yourself? No, I've never jumped out of an airplane. Oh, Don't plan on it either. So this this is all hypothetical for you. This is like you, yeah. It's, in theory, should work, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's no actual, we don't need to skydive or anything initially to gotcha. to get the Have training. you done it? Me? No. Jump out of a perfectly good airplane? No. <laughs> what? That's, that's not my idea of a good time. Right through the bottom. Yep, just push it right up. There you go. Fine. So that's strapped in. So this is your D-ring right here, okay? Mm -hmm. When you're holding on, when you're sitting in the airplane, if you're more comfortable and you want to put your hands on your shoulders and, and hold on to it, you mm -hmm. can. Just don't put your see what you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. That's not what, that, that's that's the one thing you don't want to do is make sure your hand's not holding this ring. Okay. You want to hold the straps up here, okay? Other than that, why? Degloving. Uh, so when she pulls that D-ring, if you want to turn around a little bit, uh, under here it's all tied together, and it, it'll actually it, it's the rip cord, so it'll actually oh. deploy the the parachute. Oh. It's not going to go anywhere because she's sitting on it, and there's yeah. no air pulling it out. Uh -huh. But it, it'll have to get resealed. It'll have to get re uh, repacked. Has that happened yet with a student? No, not here. It hasn't. Yee! No. Knock on wood. No, it hasn't. So like I showed you, right foot here, left foot here, and you can step on the seat, and then you kind of slide your way in. So go ahead, put your feet kind of on the front there. There you go. Yep, and slide yourself down. Why am I breathing heavy? <laughs> All right, so that's your back rest. These are going to be your shoulder harnesses, so sit back. Relax and enjoy. So you're going to have a, this is one half of your lap belt system. that right there. This is the other part. So your right shoulder harness is going to go on first, then the center harness. So before we get the plane started, if you guys want to, yeah, we're going to, I'm going to walk them back that way. Yeah. We, yeah. we want to stay pretty clear. How you feeling? Good. I didn't puke out, so I'm good. You didn't puke? Are you feeling sick now? No, I'm not feeling sick. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. It's, it was amazing. Like, it's amazing view up there. Yeah. Was it scary at all or just fun? I don't think so. It was scary, but like you were trying new things. So it was kind of exciting. Nice. Yeah. How was the, you know, the change in forces? Oh, it's, it feels very different up there. Like, you can't believe what I felt up there. Like throughout the loop. Uh -huh. And then we went through the turns and then we th uh, did, I think, 4G. So it was amazing, and he's a good pilot. Human spaceflight and the role of astronauts, what they return traditionally to the societies from which they come. You know, they, they inspire generations, they serve as ambassadors to the system, they're exemplary because they succeed, uh, succeed on the value of their own merit. They are seen as global ambassadors and they have a very high sense of service. And, and these are, are very important that we preserve these roles. and. Uh, especially in a time where, on one hand, space is becoming more democratic and more accessible and the cost point to space is, is decreasing, uh, but on the other hand, this may be seen as elitist and joy rides for billionaires. And this is something that we, uh, that fundamentally, that we want to change with the Institute by increasing opportunities and lowering bars of access for people that become professionals in human spaceflight. A possum is one of our research programs. It's our aronomy program. Uh, so, aronomy is a study of our upper atmosphere, our mesosphere, and our thermosphere. And uh, uh, POSSUM is an acronym for Polar Suborbital Science in the Upper Mesosphere. The f introductory class, Fundamentals of Astronautics, is within the, the POSSUM research program. They've had students from 54 countries all around the world. Their youngest student was actually 16 years old. And they say there is no cutoff to how old you can be to come here. However, the process is quite selective. We have two feeder programs. One is 
uh, a younger program, so they tend to be undergraduates in STEM fields, uh, or they come from an, a, a non-STEM field and they're getting involved um, building up a, a STEM literacy through the program. The uh, others are more professional students and they come from a variety of backgrounds. They can be scientists or engineers or military professionals or operational professionals, you know, surgeons or pilots, or they can be professional science communicators or educators. You know, we're trying to help build that professional workforce and, and uh, represent more primary research, not just that's funded through more traditional means, but also citizen science aspects, you know. Because there's something so alluring about the persona of the astronaut, we want to attract uh, sponsors and foundations, you know, media interests that can vest themselves in the people that are doing and conducting science. And the, and the, the, the allure of human spaceflight we think is attractive, and so we want to augment those more traditional roles by additional roles and through the citizen science path. Now, it is selective, it is competitive. We are uh, intentionally growing in a rate that we want to make sure that we can continue to provide the level of service. So uh, there is an application process, a review. This course here also is a way that we can see if uh, the, the candidates that come forth are these people that, that we can provide uh, to fully going forward because uh, a lot of our credibility comes through the credibility that we've come up with key partners. This is something that um, that's critical, that we want people that understand that uh, the research that we do is novel and it's operational, um, and yet our institute is a mix of academics and, and operations. And so we try to keep the, um, the free, uh, free-thinking, laid-back culture of academia with the rigid discipline of an operational environment. And I think that's natural here, you know, people that come from different backgrounds, they learn from each other. People that may come from more of an operational military background learn from uh, the professional academics and vice versa. Back when this was just a research program, before it grew into an institute, I was recruited um, rather surprisingly within a day to, uh, particip to, to be one of the two lead roles on a two-minute advertisement for Unilever for a fabric softener, and they wanted a real astronaut and a real ex-felon and the real mothers and they were and this story was about how they were the, both these personas were away from their mothers and somehow they wanted to buy fabric softener so um, for a quarter million dollars they set me up with this very frankly cheesy spacesuit and I was amazed at how much money was spent there and I was I just got done spending about a month preparing for a proposal for significantly less than that um, and all these scientists are clawing over each other for a small pocket of money. Uh, and here was this, all this money, and I was thinking, wow, for a quarter million dollars, I could have provided real spacesuits, I could have generated three publications, and I could have still sold their fabric softener. So where is this money being used? Why can't our scientists be our heroes? Why can't, and those heroes attract that funding from our industry, from our society? You know, the, you know I don't want to say, you know, our entertainers and our athletes and, and uh, you know, artists and those, you know, they're, they're important too, but our scientists are important. And we should, how do we become a more science participatory and science literate culture? And it comes to making sure that not every family can have a professional scientist in it, but every family can and should have a citizen scientist in it. And if we can make that happen, um, it's amazing what what the entire society can do.